epistle reading, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means deceive those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangels, Call and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. with me. Let your word dwell within us richly, O Lord. Let your truth ring as a clarion through the chatter around us. Hold us in this time that your wisdom may shape us to the depth of our humanity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear now the gospel of our Lord Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this, Jesus said. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all these young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other young women came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep away, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Few events are as emotionally fraught with the potential for disaster as weddings. So much planning and care and specifically assigned roles and expectations make up the day or the weekend or the season. Often significant money is invested. The average wedding costs $29,000 these days. Not this one, by the way, if you can see the screen in the photo of the newly married Durham family in August of 2002, just know that this wedding was done on the cheap. And I told anyone who would listen to me about that. I was so proud. $2.63 a plate for the reception dinner. On wedding day, most of the time, emotions are on the line. When things go right or when things 
things go wrong, they are remembered forever. Ask a room full of pastors to tell you their wedding stories, and you will be there for a while. There's so much that's beautiful about standing with a couple, exchanging sacred vows, feeling the expectant joy of the room as the music starts, hearing the groom burst into tears when the bride comes into view. But all clergy also have stories of things that went wrong. The time the rehearsal started an hour late because the best man got lost, or about the musician who never arrived, or the marriage license that had never been attained. On my own wedding day, the dry cleaner across the street from the church lost one of my bridesmaid's skirts, didn't find it until about 20 minutes before the ceremony began. As an officiant, I once made the mistake of assuming that the wedding photographer knew what to do, only to have him spend the entire ceremony <laughs> circling the wedding party and I on the steps of the chancel, loudly clicking and flashing his camera through the whole ceremony. I kept thinking, surely he's going to sit down at some point. No, the whole ceremony, just constant motion, clicking and flashing. When things go wrong, by the way, then they become a topic for conversation or a cautionary tale at the premarital counseling of the engaged couples. Now I always say, for example, I need to talk to your photographer, and here's why. But even with all the conversation and precaution, one thing I always assure couples about ahead of time is that something is bound to go wrong on wedding day. But it's okay, because those are the stories that you will tell of your wedding day forever. Now I say that, to encourage couples to enjoy the day, however it happens, to be in the moment, even if things don't go exactly as planned. One of my brides at that point during the counseling looked at me over the top of her very well-organized binder and confidently said, oh, nothing is going to go wrong. And I wasn't sure if I should take that as a threat <laughs> or as encouragement to think positively, but I definitely took it one of those ways. At weddings, everyone is entrusted to do their part, whether they are the efficient or the photographer or the best man or the mother of the bride or a guest. There's an expectation that you will know what it is that you are to do, that you will be prepared to do it, and that you will contribute to the joy of the day and the execution of all of the planning. In the ancient world, it wasn't so different. The weddings didn't usually require months of planning. We can assume the average cost was at least a little lower, but there were roles to play on wedding day. Everyone was expected to show up prepared to fulfill them. Perhaps this story in Matthew 25 is Jesus telling something he witnessed, his own clergy story of a wedding gone wrong. Most likely, it's a parable he's telling to help his disciples understand what it is they're supposed to do while they await his second coming. This parable is difficult. They often are. Parables are slippery to hold on to. There's never just one interpretation. Jesus' parables contain multitudes. This one is full of a cultural context, but it's very different than our own. So as we go, we'll be unpacking all of that alongside our quest to find meaning for us in this parable. And my hope on the second Sunday of Stewardship Month is for us to discover what it is to be entrusted with doing our part. In scripture, God's covenant with his people is compared to the marriage covenant. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we read about the wedding feast of the Lamb. We understand that this is what we are waiting for. Jesus has inaugurated the kingdom. We'll bring it to fullness one day. And when that day comes, we will celebrate the kingdom come. The church 
awaiting the kingdom wedding banquet. What is it that we are doing while we wait? Exploring this parable will help us understand what it is that is entrusted to us. So first of all, we are entrusted to be prepared for the wedding. We are entrusted to be prepared for the wedding. Now he is teaching his disciples alone on the Mount of Olives. In Matthew 24, he teaches about the end of days, the coming of the Son of Man, along with the importance of keeping awake, for no one knows the day nor the hour. When we get to chapter 25, Jesus is in the middle of a series of parables about the kingdom of heaven. In verse 1, he says, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. He then tells this story about 10 young women or 10 bridesmaids taking their lamps to meet the bridegroom. And when Jesus tells a parable, he's explaining a larger than life concept, the kingdom of heaven, with an analogy that is familiar to the people he is teaching. He's never saying the kingdom of heaven is exactly like this. He's never saying the kingdom of heaven is only like this, which is why he tells so many parables that start this way, all about different things. So we have to think about what it is that we are to understand about the kingdom of heaven from this particular parable. And to do that, we probably need to understand first century wedding rituals, which were very well known to the listeners gathered around Jesus on the Mount of Olives, but probably less familiar to us who live in a day and time when those rituals are so very different. Here's basically how a Jewish wedding day went in the first century. When a couple was to be married, the groom first would go to negotiate with the bride's family regarding the dowry or the amount of money that the bride's father or family will give to the groom for marrying their daughter. Once an agreement about that was reached, the groom would take the bride to his home and the marriage would be consummated. Then there would be a wedding procession from the groom's house to the bridal feast and the feast lasted seven days. The wedding procession is where we are at the start of this story. It's what we imagine the 10 young women are awaiting. They've gathered at the processional point, probably somewhere outside of the groom's house, to wait until the groom and presumably the bride appear. Why do they have their lamps? To light the way to the feast. Jesus says that five of these women were foolish and five of them were wise. What's the difference? Extra oil for the lamps. The foolish ones didn't bring flasks of oil with them in case they burned all the oil in their lamp currently waiting for the bridegroom. The wise ones brought flasks of oil with them so that when their lamps ran out, they would have a refill. All that these 10 women were to bring with them was a lamp with enough oil. They weren't responsible for the banquet or the flowers or the table settings, just oil and lamps. They were entrusted with being prepared to light the way. As Jesus's disciples, we also are called to be prepared. The oil likely symbolizes acts of devotion, love for God and neighbor. Theologian Eugene Boring calls the oil responsible deeds of discipleship. When we are responsibly following Jesus, what does that look like? When it's time to shine the light, is there oil to fuel the lamp? Do we know how to pray? to read scripture, how to discern God's will and calling, how to interpret the good news for our world. Learning and practicing these things are ways that we prepare for the bridegroom's arrival. 
Second, we are entrusted to shine light for the bridegroom. We are entrusted to shine light for the bridegroom. In Jesus's story, the bridegroom was delayed. That wasn't all that uncommon in reality. There are some key things that were sometimes difficult to predict time-wise. Often the negotiations for the dowry took a while, for example. This is an age without cell phones or text messages and waiting was just part of the culture. Not knowing when the bridegroom would come was part of being a bridesmaid. You had to be ready for the time whenever it was time. But this seems to be an extraordinary delay and the women fall asleep. Now, sleeping is not what made them foolish, by the way. The requirement was not for them to stand ready for hours, just that they would be ready when the time came. I think that's important. The point of Christian life is not to exhaust ourselves with doing, but to be ready to do our part when it's time. And the time came for these young women. Verse six, but at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. They cut the wick to the appropriate length so the lamp can be relit, but there's a problem. They've waited so long that all of their lamps are out of oil. The ones who brought their flasks of oil, though, they're prepared. They refill their lamps, they light their wicks, They are ready to lead the procession to the feast. The ones without oil, they asked to borrow some of the oil that the others brought. But guess what the prepared bridesmaids know? They know that if they lend some of their oil, none of them will have enough to light the way to the feast. I suppose that's wisdom that's part of being prepared. Now, is Jesus saying never lend anyone anything? Never give anyone who asks for your help something. No, from the rest of scripture, we know that that's not what Jesus means. But in this case, the ones without extra oil are left to find a 24 hour convenience store that sells oil so that they can finally process to the feast. The real point of the preparation was to be ready when it became time to shine light for the bridegroom so that the wedding party and the families can find their way to the feast. And for disciples of Christ, that's also a task that we have been entrusted with doing. We shine light for the kingdom so that all might find their way to the wedding feast of the Lamb. We do this with our lamps filled with gratitude and kindness and love. We do this as we announce in our daily living that Christ is present with us. We do this as we live into Jesus's words in Matthew 5, 16, when he teaches, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. We do this as we hold out hope for the kingdom of heaven and encourage others to do the same. And that's the third thing we're entrusted with. We are entrusted to wait with hope for the feast. We are entrusted to wait with hope for the feast. This parable ends with the foolish bridesmaids finally arriving at the feast only to find that the door has been closed their unpreparedness, the events of having to go find oil and missing the procession, their arrival at the door once the processional festivities have finished means that they also miss the feast. The bridegroom does not let them into the hall, saying, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. And then Jesus to his disciples says, keep awake, therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. Matthew's congregation, the person who wrote this gospel, his congregation is probably a Jewish congregation who would have received this written account of the events of Christ's life probably some 30 or 40 years after Christ's resurrection. They've been waiting for Christ's return, but it's taking much longer than the early Christians thought it would. We heard that in the reading that Keith read from Thessalonians this morning where Paul says, "Um, those of you that are still alive when Christ returns, 
speaking to the church at Thessalonica, um, there's a sense that it was thought it was gonna, it was gonna be very immediate happening any day now. And so the early Christians have possibly grown weary in awaiting Christ's return all these years later, amid all the trials and tribulations of being a disciple of Jesus Christ in the later half of the first century, this parable is a reminder for them to keep their lamps trimmed and burning with hope that comes from anticipation of Christ's reign, where all that is so wrong in their world would be set right, where there will be no more pain or persecution or death or threats of death, when all things will bend back to the good eventually. And for us too, who have in some cases lived our entire lives hearing about Christ's return, but never experiencing it, we may need this reminder too, lest the delay in his coming dilute our urgency in preparing for it. For some reason, church, the bridegroom is delayed. We don't know when he will arrive, but that does not excuse us from our responsibility to be prepared with oil in our lamps, to shine light so that people will find their way and to be hopeful about his return. It strikes me that there are two extremes that we can live in here. We can become anxious about the return of Christ to the point trying to predict when it will happen, trying to read the signs, becoming self-proclaimed prophets of the apocalypse, living with fear and striking fear in the hearts of others. For those of us who tend that way, take heart. In this parable, even the prepared bridesmaids were able to sleep. We need not be anxious or terrified or proclaim a gospel of fear to our neighbors. We just need to be prepared for whenever the time comes. The other extreme is to be lulled into thinking there's no urgency in preparing for the Lord's coming or that others have done enough and that will ensure our entry to the feast or that there will be enough time later to do what we need to do. But Jesus says, keep awake, not physically, but spiritually, keep awake to not grow weary, to remain hopeful and ready for Christ's return. Whenever that time comes, it's a joyful day, the day of Christ's coming, a feast for which we have been chosen, an occasion for which we have been entrusted with lighting the way. The spiritual we are about to sing says, children, don't grow weary, for the time is drawing nigh. As Christ's own family, may we not grow weary as we wait with hope. Amen. I thought you, it seems like this could be one we should stand up for. What do you think, Nancy? Sure. <laughs> Bye. Nancy says she's standing. Why don't you join her um, as we sing together? The words are in your bulletin. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. I think um, I'm inspired by the sermon to change a line in this song. <laughs> um, where it says, for the time is drawing nigh. I think I'm changing it to see what the Lord has done. Um, there's another version of the song that has that line in. Um, that we would, while we're waiting, that we would just be shining the light for the bridegroom and living for him. Yeah. 
Okay. 